And Shanghai inventories have also been rising really for the last several months uh, and are ample. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship between COMEX Silver Open Interest and inventories. You can see the red line open interest. Um, it got very high in the period 2016 to 2018. A lot of that was actually some investors going short silver because the price was going nowhere. As the price of silver rose, the open interest, the number of contracts declined. That doesn't necessarily mean that investors were pulling back from investing in silver. In fact, I think that uh, they, they were pretty good. But again, investors like central banks tend to think in dollar terms. And as the price went from $15 to $30, $28, $30, the same amount of money bought fewer COMEX contracts. So you saw a decline in open interest in terms of the number of contracts or the number of ounces represented by those contracts. And you can see that the open interest has always been higher than the amount of inventories that have been registered and eligible and readily available to meet COMEX deliveries should the people who take deliveries of the COMEX futures contracts decide to take delivery of the physical metal, right? So you've always had this big gap between the inventories that underwrite, if you will, the open interest and the open interest. And it's never been a problem. Never. Not going to drain that swamp. Not that it's a swamp. It's not. This is another month-end inventories relative to deliveries. The blue lines at the bottom are the deliveries, a fraction of the open interest and a fraction of the inventories. A fraction. How much of a fraction? That's on the right-hand side, less than 10%. And those are deliveries of contracts. Again, a lot of those contracts that get delivered are delivered to companies that look at them and then re-deliver them, reissue them back onto the COMEX the next day. And as I said, investors haven't really walked away from silver. What you have seen over the last couple of years is a reduction in the gross short positions held by investors in the futures market. There are fewer people willing to bet against silver prices. And you have seen something of an increase over the same period of time, you know, from 250 to 450 million ounces. That's a pretty substantial increase in the gross long positions and thus the net positions. So there's still a very active interest in being long silver in the futures market and in the ETFs. ETFs have been, uh, holdings have been relatively stable. We did see a decline from say 2020, 2021, the COVID lockdown um, to uh, 2023. But since 2023, you've seen a little bit of an increase. So investors still like it. Fabrication demand, the great part is what everybody's talking about, photovoltaics, solar panels. And it has gone from very little 20 years ago to a substantial portion of the silver market, close to 300 million ounces. I'll show you a chart in a second. If you take that out and you look at other fabrication demand, it's basically been declining over the last 20 years. You saw a decline in the photo industry's use of silver as we moved to digital imaging. You've seen a decline in the amount of silver used in jewelry, uh, partly because of the higher silver price uh, jewelers are using less silver per piece and investor and, and consumers are buying less silver jewelry because it's somewhat more expensive. Um, and electronics and other uses have actually held up relatively well. Even if you add in the solar pan panels, what we've really seen is a pretty good increase over the last 15, 20 years in total silver fabrication demand which has helped underpin the silver price 
and drive it higher. On the left-hand side, you have solar panels. We saw a big surge in 2023. The solar panel industry overbuilt. You are now operating probably around 60%, maybe down to 50% capacity utilization. There's a tremendous overcapacity in global solar panel manufacturing uh, inst uh, factories. And you saw an overbuild in 2023. You saw silver bought purchases by the solar panel industry go from about 130 to 200 million ounces in 2023. About a third of that silver went into panels that were unsold in 2023. So in 2024, you saw a very modest increase because about a third of the demand for solar panels in 2024 was met by inventory manufactured in 2023. And our expectation is that it's going to grow a little bit more this year. If we go into recession, if the government gets rid of various governments get rid of um, subsidies and tax breaks for solar panels, you could see a decline in solar panel use. And on the right-hand side, you have Chinese silver uh, fabrication demand with our projection for 2025. We saw a decline in 2024, reflecting economic uh, constraints within China. Our expectation is that it might be a little bit lower this year. Secondary recovery has boosted total supply. You have seen an increase in mine production over the last five years, uh, modest, and you've seen a in larger increase in secondary recovery, partly because of the higher silver price, stimulating the resale of jewelry and decorative items. Also, uh, increased uh, recycling of electronics, uh, end-of-life electronics. These are the USGS data on reserves, mineable reserves and the reserve base. Uh, and you can see that we have about 18 billion ounces of reserves. These are known, mineable, economically mine, uh, profitably to be mined reserves at around the world. That's basically double where we were a quarter of a century ago. A lot of stuff out there. And then there are resources, which are not necessarily economically profitable to be mined today at today's price. But if you go to 40 or $50 an ounce, all of a sudden you have a giant surge in reserves because you have these resources that weren't economic to be mined at 20 or 25 or $30 an ounce, all of a sudden are economically mineable at $40. And that's something to watch out for when you're looking at mining companies' data. What's the price at which they value their reserves and resources? They'll say, you'll find sometimes uh, that a mining company will report an increase in reserves. And when you look at it, it's because they are valuing their reserves and resources and classifying them at a higher price. Well, we used to use $10 an ounce. Now we're using 15 or 20. And that takes a lot of resources and makes them into reserves which increases the reserve base without you discovering new mines. Silver's optimal role in a portfolio historically. If you look at silver prices and silver capital appreciation from 1968, this says 2019, but it actually goes through 20, most of 2024. It's basically the same kind of data. But you find that if you took a, stock, a portfolio of stocks and bonds, 50% of each, and you started adding silver in 5% increments, what happens is you increase the return faster than you increase the risk. And up to about 20, 30%, that's true, historically. So silver is good. It's not as dynamic as gold, if you look at this, these curves in gold, because it's a more volatile metal. So the risk increases with the silver, but the returns also increase. And yes, silver is less than 0.1% of global wealth. So silver makes sense. It makes sense to add it to your wealth 
It makes sense to hold some of your wealth in silver. It makes sense to hold uh, silver in a diversified portfolio. But investors, by and large, don't do that. We'll be releasing our yearbooks, March, May, June, July. There will be the booklet that will come out with this, and you'll receive it next week or the week after that, depending on how jammed up we are. And then you can go to our website. Let's open it up for questions, and I'm going to put these glasses on so that I can see these questions. My colleague and partner, off, uh, Carlos, usually does this, but he's busy right now. Would this week's silver price spike be caused by forced liquidations of short contracts held by speculators that wanted to profit from shorting but are in loss now? No, I don't think so. I, our view is that you are looking at um, large open interest rolling from the March active COMEX contract to the May contract. And let me see if I can do something that's inappropriate here. This is as of yesterday. If you go back to like January 30th, you had 600, more than 600 million ounces of open interest in the May contract. Two days ago, that was down to 264 million ounces. May is now it was up to 456 million ounces two days ago. So you're seeing this roll. Most of that is not necessarily uh, speculators betting on the silver price decline. I showed you that chart earlier. Most of that is actually um, fabricators, um, uh, trading companies doing that. And the trading companies, I will say it again, and I think most people, 90% or more of people involved in the silver market understand this, but the other 10% are very vocal. <clears throat> if I'm a bank, I own physical silver. I lease it out the way I explained it earlier. I'm long silver. I have positive exposure to rising silver prices and negative exposure to falling silver prices. I hedge that. I hedge that by selling short someplace. And the place where I find the liquidity to do that is the New York Comex. Right? Very simple. And if I'm a bullion trading desk in a bank or at a trading company, I'm probably using borrowed money. And my lender says, I will lend you money to trade commodities, but commodities are volatile. Silver and natural gas are the two most volatile prices of, among commodities. And I'll lend you money to, to use uh, in your trading, but you have to be hedged. So those short positions that traders and banks have on the COMEX are hedges. They're price neutral. You know, I saw some guy who's always like crying on the internet talking about how silver prices are going to skyrocket. You really do your family a favor and buy it to, from me today. You know, he hedges. He's got silver inventory. Oh, yeah. That was the other thing. We're running out of silver. But I have a bunch, so I can sell it to you. That silver he has, he hedges on the comet. And then he rails, oh, yeah, you know, the manipulation of the shorts on the comics. And excuse me, you are a short. Yeah. You go back about a decade ago, and there were various silver touts who were saying, let's bankrupt JP Morgan and buy physical silver. And that'll drive the price of silver higher and uh, we'll bankrupt them because of their massive short position. No. Their massive short position might have had a mark-to-market loss, but their massive long position had a mark-to-market gain. And that year, when the touts were, let's bankrupt J.P. Morgan, that year, J.P. Morgan had record profits in its silver hedging, in its silver trading book. Thank you very much. You didn't bankrupt us. You gave us a record year 
and you helped us in the bullion trading department justify to senior management that they should keep the gold and silver trading operation because it's profitable as well as a fundamental form of banking. Yeah. So here it is. So, so it's not forced liquidation. It's a normal rule of short positions from one active month to another. And that is reflected in the fact that the silver price has risen. And we still have three days left in the trading days before March becomes deliverable. And March COMEX contracts are deliverable throughout March. It doesn't go off the board until the end of March. So that role can continue. But as I showed you, we've already gone from 612 million ounces or something down to 260 million ounces. I didn't look at the numbers today because I was busy with other stuff this morning. I'm sure it's down even more. Um, and again, as the police might would, would say, nothing to look at here. The silver have changed to go chance to go to fifty dollars in the next one year. Yes, silver have gone to almost fifty dollars twice in history. Nineteen eighty, January nineteen eighty, it was there for I think five minutes, and then uh, end of April two thousand eleven, when it, I think it was there for 20 minutes. Silver can go to $50. Silver can go over $50. It can't stay there. And that goes back to this cognitive dissonance about investors. Oh yeah, well, I think silver's going to $75. Why? Well, because of the fundamentals. Well, no, the fundamentals are exactly what keeps the price from going to $75. Price of silver could go to $75 if it goes to 50 or if it goes to 75, it goes there because a lot of investors rushed into the market and were buying, bidding the price up, not because of tight supply fabrication demand relationships. The tight supply demand relationship that doesn't actually exist is what keeps the price from staying at $50 or staying above $50 or staying at $75. Right, because you have all of those reserves that can be mined, and you have additional resources that become mineable reserves, and you have all of that silver, 26 billion ounces of jewelry and silverware. And if you go back to 1980, or if you go back to 2011, you didn't see 26 billion ounces of jewelry melted down. You only saw about 100 million ounces. So that's a lot. That's a lot of silver. That's 10% of supply added on top of other stuff. So you have the ability to quickly increase supply from scrap. You have the ability to increase supply on a longer term basis by developing mines. And then you have fabricators who can reduce the amount of silver that they use overnight. Yeah. So the fundamentals preclude the price staying that high. And you have these investors who say, well, I'm bullish on silver because of the fundamentals, and I think the price is going to go to $50 or $75. But it's not going to go to $50 or $75 based on the fundamentals. It's going to go there because investors race into the market and say, I'm a gambling fool. 